Hello, and welcome to Political Science 102, Introduction to American Government and Politics. I am Dr. Dina Bozanellis, and I'll be lecturing on Chapter 3 in Maroney and Kirsch's book, By the People, Debating American Government, entitled The Constitution. Please make sure that when you are listening to this lecture, that you also have the PowerPoint for Chapter 2 of it, or Chapter 3, excuse me, to follow along. I will frequently be referencing the PowerPoints as the semester progresses, especially when it comes to graphs. <clears throat> you can either print out the PowerPoints, or for those of you who have Windows 7 and above, have a split screen with the PowerPoint available. It is my advice that you have the printed PowerPoints with notes from the lecture and the book on the PowerPoints before you take the quizzes. Many times students are poorly on the quizzes, they are found to be looking for the answers without having read the book, or try to answer the questions simultaneously while watching the video. As these questions are randomized, this strategy won't work. So let's begin then. In this chapter, what uh, um, Maroney and Kirsch are trying to do, <clears throat> excuse me, is give us an understanding of, of the Constitution and how we ended up um, in this, how we ended up with our Constitution in the first place. And so this chapter will discover the roots of the Constitution in colonial and revolutionary America. Um, we'll see why Americans actually declared independence from England and we'll learn about our first constitution, uh, the failed Articles of Confederation. We'll follow the arguments that shaped the constitution, and then we'll provide an overview of the final document. Then we'll read about the great national debate over whether to adopt it, and then we'll learn how Americans have changed the constitution and how the constitution has actually changed um, America itself. Now, there are six colonial roots of the constitution that I want to look at. And one of the first ones that I want to uh, mention is that of distance um, from England. And in fact, I think this is really, really, really important for us to understand that for the American colonies, they had a strong measure of independence that is different than many other colonies that you may see around the world, uh, primarily because the British, uh, when they sent colonists over here, when colonists came over here, they essentially forgot about them. They didn't really think that they would make it, and if they did make it, they said, great, good for you. Many of them were fleeing religious persecution. So the homeland, uh, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, and North Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland, they weren't too concerned whether or not the American colonists were going to make it. And so, you know, given the fact that the colonies were 3,000 miles away from the king, and the fact that the English policy of ignoring the colonies is what we call uh, salutary neglect, it actually permitted the colonies to kind of develop their own political institutions. And then when the English finally came back around in the mid-1700s and started reasserting control or interfering in colonial affairs, it backfired tremendously. The American colonists said, hey, now all of a sudden you're interested in what we're doing. Well, this then set up the idea of self-governing colonial legislatures. As the colonists were essentially on their own, they set up these own, their own institutions that could govern themselves. And the colonists had a great deal of experience with representation. They were pretty adamant that they were going to have some kind of representation in these new governments. Whereas opposed in England, a representation was limited at that time. There was representation in the parliament in London, but it was limited. And as were in the rest of Europe, there was very little representation for the common person. And so in, you know, America kind of grew up arguing about representation. And it's something that was kind of instilled from the beginning. Now, um, there were also what we refer to as uh, the riches of North America and plentiful land. So even though colonial America was not an equal society, it actually was a land of what we call extraordinary social mobility. So keep in mind that, you know, we had indentured servants, we had slaves, we had quite a few people that were... Um, very well below in terms of those who owned land or those who were business people. But what was interesting is for many indentured servants, while they couldn't get out of their servitude, their children could. And for many slaves, slaves had the option, in some cases, had the option of buying their own freedom. And in other colonies, they actually abolished slavery altogether. And so what you saw in the United States, in the colonies, that people could come to the U.S., mainly from Europe, and that they could achieve a remarkable degree of social mobility, that they could actually move up in, in terms of status. Now, interestingly enough, many of them just simply became, um, self, uh, became uh, small farmers. And so around the eve of the revolution, around 80% of all Americans were actually agrarian. They were small farmers. But that meant that these small farmers could farm the land, 
keep the crops, sell the crops for profit, and then use that money to buy things. Whereas back in England or in France or in other European countries, you share crops. You worked on the land owned by a noble, and then what happened is you gave half your crops to the lord or the, or the, uh, the, the, the noble of that land, and then you kept half the crops. Well, that barely seemed to be enough to survive at times. So you really had social mobility uh, here in, uh, in the colonies, and that really did help because that developed the sense of a middle class. It's kind of been the bedrock of our American society. Uh, the fourth is that of colonial compacts or covenants. Um, this is kind of, this is really important because uh, starting from the Mayflower compact, which you see here on the slide, many of the colonists when they arrived agreed that they would pledge to work together, signing a mutual agreement that would allow them to, uh, um, to solve their problems peacefully, to determine leadership, uh, to determine, you know, you know, work trials. They really decided to write down the rules of the society. And essentially, when you look at our constitution, that's, a, that's what it is. It's, it's the founders writing down the rules of what our society should look like. And so we have experience with this, starting with the Mayflower Compact and, and other covenants that uh, came through in different colonies. Now, the fifth one is that of religious freedom. You know, as I mentioned before, many colonists actually came to the New World uh, to practice their religion in peace. And so across the colonies, what you saw were very different religions. Um, in fact, certain colonies were founded for fleeing persecution. For example, the Puritans were fleeing England, and they founded Massachusetts in, in the uh, Plymouth Bay colony. Uh, Catholics that were being persecuted fled to Maryland. And interesting, Lord Baltimore from England helped found uh, the colony of, of Maryland, or the land of Mary, the Catholic Queen of Scots. And so that's where the name comes from. And, and Baltimore, the city is named after Lord Baltimore, who helped uh, provide the funding and the organization necessary so that way Catholics could flee um, um, persecution in England as well. And so you had Anglicans in Virginia, Quakers in Philadelphia, uh, Baptists that were coming up, or Anabaptists, I should say, at that time they called themselves in a... Um, in uh, uh, um, Georgia, you started having a very significant uh, Jewish population, started moving to New York at that time. So you had quite a bit of religious freedom. And as I mentioned in the last chapter, remember now the U.S. does not have an established religion, which is allowed for what we call a religious marketplace that allows for religion to compete for memberships, which keeps the vibrancy of, uh, of religion going in the United States. Now, the sixth one is unstable borders, and I think this is very key because the border areas in early America were violent and insecure. Um, there were very, very brutal wars with the Native Americans. I mean, we can't uh, talk enough about how much of the land that was acquired by the colonists was forcibly taken by Native Americans who lost in pitched battles uh, with the colonists. And so essentially there just seemed to be so many colonists that they actually kind of just overrun the colonial boundaries. In fact, when we talk a little bit more, we'll talk about how after the French and Indian War, one of the things that the British had to do was really put, keep uh, American colonists from pushing over the Appalachian Mountains and into Native American land. And that caused a lot of friction with Native Americans. Uh, but the land, the, the population pressure was there. More and more thousands of people were moving. And so it put pressure on, um, on the British government to do something about this. Okay. So in the next slide, what we'll see is what I mentioned earlier, the French and Indian War. Now, the French and Indian War is also known as the Seven Years' War, and it's kind of a uh, culmination of, of imperial rivalry between England and France. So what had happened in this is that, a, uh, um, uh, as I mentioned, as colonists kept coming over the Appalachian Mountains and they were putting pressure on Native American lands, Native Americans allied themselves with uh, certain Native American tribes, I should say, not all they allied themselves um, with the French government in order to try and uh, keep the colonists at bay and in some cases to retake land. And so what you saw was the beginning of a war between the American colonists and the, um, and the French and the Native Americans on one side. Now, the American colonists were kind of outmanned and outgunned. For example, Colonel Washington at that time, or Colonel George Washington, he was fighting for the British Army, and he actually lost what we call the Battle of Pittsburgh and was taken prisoner. So we kind of were having these string of, of, of defeats. The British then, you know, come rushing to the defense of the American colonies. They brought over about, uh, you know, about 100,000 soldiers, uh, when about 10,000 remained. And, you know, they ended up defeating the French and the Indians. And so what happened is they took over most of the land 
that the French and Native Americans had, had uh, um, existed on. And they essentially forced more Native Americans and, and forced almost the entire uh, French colonies out into Quebec or down into Louisiana. So this British defeat of the French army in 1763 uh, brought about two major changes. One I just mentioned, that there were 10,000 English troops that remained in the colonies, and that day of salutary neglect was over. In other words, from here on out, what you saw was uh, that if there's 10,000 troops in England, that means there's generals, and if there's generals, they're in command, and they're making decisions. Um, England also ran up the debt during the war, and so for many of the, uh, for the English, they saw it as only fair that the Americans would actually pay um, for protecting them. And so, you know, in England, they paid a tax that was much higher than what the colonists uh, were asked to pay. But keep in mind, you're talking about a hundred and something years of neglect. Yes, the, the British soldiers came and, you know, defended, successfully defended the colonies. Uh, the colonists were thankful for that, but the colonists were asked to pay tax. And the colonists said, okay, fine, we're going to pay a tax, but if we're going to pay a tax, we'd like to have seats in Parliament that would allow us to determine where the money goes. And so the British said, uh, no. The British said, uh, that doesn't, no, that's not how this works. You're the colony, we're the empire, and what will happen is we'll decide where the money's going to go. We just saved you, therefore you don't really have a voice in this. The colonists actually reacted explosively to this. They, they couldn't handle this. They were like, well, wait a minute now. You didn't pay attention to us. Now you are paying attention to us. Now you've got 10,000 troops living among us, and now you want us to pay higher taxes. For example, what we call the stamp tax. The stamp tax is a, uh, like a little imprint that's put on every single paper that makes it official. Without that imprint, it isn't official, so that means any receipt, any certificates, like a marriage certificate or a diploma, needs that little, like, that little imprint, almost like an embossing, and that would allow um, it to be official. And so the American people reacted extremely negatively to this, saying, look, we, all we want is if we're going to pay taxes, we want representation in Parliament. And that's where the slogan comes from, no taxation without representation. It comes from this era here. Now, if you look at the land, oh, what I want to show you here, and it's kind of hard um, to see, maybe I can, I can try to, uh, to do this, um, is that you see there the uh, British American colonies, and you see on the one side before the French and Indian War, and here's what I was talking about right here, um, oh, and this may not work, I'm sorry, I'm trying to use my highlighter here, this, uh, um, this, this, where the green and the pink area come together is actually um, the Appalachian Mountains. And that was keeping, it was a, a set of mountains that was keeping the American colonists at bay. But as more and more people coming over, it, the American colonists kind of pushed up and over the Appalachian Mountains and into Native American lands and French-owned lands, fearing, again, the colonists, you know, kind of taking over by force. They bought, fought them back. British landed troops, they beat them back. And by the time, um, you know, the, the French and Native were over, you see that the French had been pretty much removed completely by, uh, uh, from the area, and Native Americans, for the most part, in that Ohio River Valley right there, had been um, um, defeated and, uh, and vanquished. Now, Americans, again, were used to making their own decisions. When England um, uh, violated this American idea of self-rule, it created kind of an unusual revolution. And this is what's made the American Revolution very different than many other revolutions, is that you know, in other, other colonial revolutions or other colonial uprisings, you had a heavy administration, heavy British or French or German presence that was managing. Remember, these colonies pretty much were unmanaged, and so they were managing themselves and gotten used to it. And so they were really sort of Americans were kind of fighting to preserve rights that they had already been exercising um, while they had been neglected. And so for many uh, uh, Americans, um, they considered their assemblies, you know, the legitimate voice of the people, you know, and if taxes had to be raised, they said we should do it. Parliament wants to raise taxes, and we need representation in Parliament. And so they worried, you know, um, they, they worried about where the money was going. And so they called this uh, political theorists would call this delegate representation. You know, when representatives actually follow the the wishes of the voters. So in other words, if the American people are paying taxes and they're voting on 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 representatives and the representatives are not, you know, are not spending the money the way they see fit, then the American people can remove those delegates or those representatives and then put in new ones. So that's delegate representation, where the people that you've elected 
are making sure that you're following your wishes. Now think about this. If you're an American colonist and your representation is in Parliament in London, you don't really know if these folks are actually representing your views. Now maybe you could even elect some to go over there to Parliament, which is what the colonists were asking. Parliament said no, not at all. Remember, you're the colonists <coughs> were the empire. Now interestingly enough, from the British point of view, they never really thought that the voters' wishes need to be taken into account. They believe in what they call um, trustee representation, that representatives do what they regard as being in the best interest of the voters. In other words, these, you elect folks, they go to parliament, and then they make the best decisions possible. It may not be necessarily what the people want, but it might be what's better for the nation overall. And so this idea between delegate and trustee representation, um, you know, is, it was a driving factor in the War of Independence, the American Revolution. It's also a major factor in today's politics as well. Think about this. When you vote, are you voting to have somebody do as you wish, or are you voting to have somebody make the best decision? And you're going to tell me, well, Professor, both. The answer is no, not really, because if you entrust, uh, you know, the congressman, uh, um, in Paul Cook in the high desert, uh, to make the best decision, then he may, may, may not make the best decision of the community, but he may make the best decision in terms of the nation. Whereas, um, you know, if you want Paul Cook to be a delegate, then he needs to make uh, the best decision, he needs to make the decision that satisfies your needs. The example that I use in class between delegate and trustee representation is that of what happened over in the Johnson Valley OHV area where in Johnson Valley, the Marine Corps wanted to annex a certain part of it um, so it could use for, for testing and for uh, exercise. And so Paul Cook, your representative in Congress, being a retired military or Marine Corps colonel, he could have easily said, okay, you know, I'm going to be a trustee uh, and I'm going to agree with the Marine Corps and extend this base and allow for it to be used because we need the Marines to practice so when they go to war overseas, they can better prepare themselves. However, um, OHV, OHV enthusiasts in the desert were fighting this, saying, no, this is our area. This is where we go riding. We can't really ride much else in the desert, so if this land is taken away from us, then we're not going to have um, many places to go. And so that, if, if Paul Cook were to side with the OHV enthusiasts, that would make him a delegate. Uh, 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 that would make this delegate representation. And so ultimately, Paul Cook decided to side with the OHV enthusiasts, and so he chose delegate representation over trustee representation. So you still see this today. Um, this is something that they talked about. What do your elected representatives do? They do your wishes or they do what's in the best interest of the overall country? And that's something that um, the colonists said, look, we, we don't know these folks in London. They're not going to make decisions in our favor, so ultimately we, we're not going to trust them with our taxes. And so uh, the British actually, uh, in order to also recoup some of their, uh, um, their, their, their debt, they started enforcing mercantilist trade policies. What we mean by mercantilist trade policies, it's kind of an economic theory in which government controls foreign trade in order to maintain prosperity and security. In other words, the British wanted to control colonial trade so they could profit to make back some of the money that they spent uh, on the French and Indian War. And so, for example, American ships would do business with Caribbean nations. They would do business with South America. And American ships had to bypass these traditional partners. They said, nope, you can't sell cotton to the French. You've got to sell cotton to us, and then we'll sell it to the French. So that meant, you know, higher prices, lower profits, or you cannot buy molasses or sugar to make rum from the Caribbean. You have to buy molasses from a British merchant who then bought it from the Caribbean. So actually what you saw in the run-up to the revolution was a lot of smuggling. Uh, Americans were renowned for being uh, uh, smugglers. Now, not quite pirates, per se, but uh, they smuggled a lot of things into the United States. They were, you know, rum running is, is what they used to call it. And so um, a lot of American founders of the American Navy actually got cut their teeth in uh, running rum uh, in the Caribbean uh, uh, back in the 1770s and 17, uh, 1760s, 1770s, 1770s, 1780s. So the Townsend Act um, was a response by the um, um, by uh, Parliament uh, in, to, in lifting the stamp tax. Remember, I mentioned that they had uh, imposed a stamp tax as a way to kind of recoup the costs of the debts of the French and Indian War. Well, there was such an uproar because what had happened is the colonists had um, organized what's known as a Stamp Act Congress, and this was the actual first time that the American colonists had come together for a cause ever. And they all agreed that they were going to boycott British goods until 
the, um, until the British lifted the stamp acts. Now, that hurt business in London. Merchants were complaining, and so Parliament lifted the, um, the uh, Stamp Act, but in response, they imposed what's known as the Townsend Acts. And so the Townsend Acts instituted another new round of taxes, and revenues were earmarked to pay for a new colonial authority, what we call the American Board of Customs, which would collect taxes independently of the colonial assemblies. And so the Townsend Acts also suspended the New York State Assembly, and also, you know, for, because the New York State Assembly refused to house and supply uh, British troops. And so, again, what you saw was the idea of establishing an imperial bureaucracy. No more salutary neglect. In other words, now the British are paying attention to the American colonies. They're trying to impose their order on, on, on hundreds of thousands of people who, for the longest time, for you're talking about six generations, have been able to manage themselves just nicely. Uh, you know, the um, American people responded with petitions. They responded with meetings and mobs. Um, you saw a whole range of things that happened. There were a group of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, Boston colonists who were seething over having, um, you know, their legislation dissolved. Mobs were harassing custom officials. And so what you saw was a group of Bostonians that were marching. Uh, you know, they were marching towards the customs house, and British soldiers told them to stop. There was kind of a tense standoff, and then a gun went off somewhere in the distance. That a British soldier thought that it was they were shooting at them, so they ordered the you know they ordered the British to lower their weapons, and they shot into the crowd, and they ended up killing um, you know five people. And this is the first time that you would say that you saw five Americans, uh, five people dying uh, in the cause of, of what it means to be American. And so one of the first people that I actually was a uh, freed slave uh, by the name of Crispus Attucks. And um, he was the son of an African slave and an Attic Indian. And he thought, he, many people think that he escaped slavery, though some people argue that he may have actually bought his way out of slavery. We're not quite sure. But his death is memorialized in an engraving by Paul Revere. Yes, yes that same Paul Revere, the one who said the British are coming, the British are coming. Um, you know, he, he put this into writing. And this engraving went in, you know, was then put in newspapers all throughout the country. And it showed, you know, the barbarity, quote unquote, that the British were using on peaceful Ameri on a peaceful colonist, uh, colonial uh, protesters. Uh, the next major uh, event was out of the Boston Tea Party, um, following the Boston Massacre. In the Boston Tea Party, what had happened is the British had repealed all the Townsend duties um, on, or, and taxes, except for that on tea. You know, and tea was a global industry. You know, think of uh, tea as being like, um, I know the iPhone, I mean, the, the, the iPhone of today, I mean, everybody had to have tea. That's, you know, Americans don't drink tea as much as they drink coffee. Coffee is kind of our, our, our caffeinated beverage of choice. But um, tea was it, and so you could only get tea through the British. They charged a lot for it, and uh, they put a tax on it. And so, you know, what happened is a number of colonists dressed up as Native Americans went out into the harbor. Um, the harbor back then, the tide had receded, and so the, the ship was stuck um, in the mud. So they kind of half walked, half rode over there, got on into the boat, took 342 chests of tea and dumped it into the water and mud below. And so, you know, you can imagine that you can't really use tea when you dump it into water and mud. And it was about $2 million worth of damage um, that you would cause, uh, the, to, that you would think of today. Now, the British were absolutely furious. They said, this is it. You know, and they passed what's known as the Intolerable Acts. And they said the colonists must either triumph or they will submit. And so they closed down Boston Harbor. They abolished town meetings. Um, they authorized the quartering of troops in any home in Massachusetts. They basically put the state of Massachusetts under um, military control, and the generals were in charge. Um, you know, and so Americans, though, as you can imagine, they were not going to submit. <laughs> they were not going to deal with this. And so the Continental Congress first met in 17, or in September 1774, and they petitioned for an end to the Intolerable Acts. Now, interestingly enough, um, when the Continental Congress met, fighting had actually broken out. Um, in April of 17, uh, um, um, the, excuse me, there, there was already a sense of, of building up and towards the violence. Now, the Continental Congress did not ask for independence. 
they were not looking to separate from England. What they wanted to say was, hey, you know what, we have real grievances. You need to take our grievances seriously. Yet these grievances were ignored by the British. And so before the uh, Second Continental Congress could meet, uh, fighting had begun. In April of 1775, uh, the British commander in Boston, General Thomas Gage, sent 1,000 troops out from Boston to seize guns and ammunition from a, that were stored at Concord, Massachusetts. Now, armed colonists who called themselves Minutemen blocked the way, and they came under British fire at Lexington and Concord. Eight were shot dead. Uh, the British found and destroyed the weapons, but their march back to Boston was horrific, as the Minutemen hid uh, behind rocks and trees and sniped at them along the way. All, all along, the British lost about 300 men. And that shot, that, uh, um, you know, uh, the first shot that was taken by the British against the uh, um, um, uh, against the American colonists is often referred to as the shot heard around the world because this harkened basically the end of niceties between the colonists and the empire. Uh, they were going to war. And so this is the kind of the culmination of a long legacy of things. You know, um, you know, you see that in the U.S. we've kind of had this, uh, um, you know, we harken back a lot to the, to the Revolutionary Wars. This is our our birthing moments per, per se. And so when you hear, you know, um, you know, when the Tea Party itself, you know, uh, tea stands for tax enough already, but it also a play on Tea Party. It comes from this revolutionary era. When you hear about Minutemen that patrol the border with Mexico, they get their name from this revolutionary action. Uh, militias, you know, there are, are different self-styled militias out there. It's from this era. So this heritage really still plays a large narrative in how we see ourselves today um, in the United States. Now, the Declaration of Independence was put forth through the Second Continental Congress. After the battles of uh, Lexington and Concord, the Second Continental Congress said, you know, we're not looking for uh, grievances. We're, we're looking to separate, you know, at this time. And what they did is they voted to adopt the Declaration of Independence. And it was a statement of the, world's, uh, of the world of America's purpose. And so the document tends to have two parts. You know, the first part is a statement of principles, and the second part is a list of grievances. Now, the first part, that statement of principles in the Declaration, declaration states, as I mentioned in, in, in back in Chapter uh, 2, that all people are equal, endowed with the rights that cannot be taken away, include life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, governments form to protect rights, and governments derive power from the consent of the governed. Now, the grievances in the Declaration uh, talked about the violations of the right of representation, maintenance um, of a standing army not under civilian control, and loss of an independent court. And so these grievances, and there's about 13 of them that are listed in the uh, back end of the Declaration of Independence, but you, know, you, can, you can really kind of show that the American colonists said, look, we've got legitimate complaints. We're not just separating from England out of profit or separating from England out of, you know, uh, just a, a, a curiosity. We have real grievances. They're violating our rights that we know to be true to what we think we are as humans. And nobody can take away these rights. They're God-given. Not even the king can do this himself. And so really what you saw was a, the, first, uh, the first real successful attempt at separating uh, what we call divine rule. For many people felt that the king was the representative of God on earth. So if you kind of go against the king, you're going against, um, if you're going against God indirectly. And so the American colonists said, no, 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 the king is not the representative of God on earth. The king is just the king. He represents his interests. His interests are not our interests. In fact, he has gone against our interests, and so that's why we're, we're divorcing, essentially, um, from this marriage. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the most favorite phrases um, that we have out of um, the American Revolution is no taxation without representation. I want you to um, understand something here. Americans today often focus on the first part, no taxation. But the, the second part of that clause is actually the more important one, without representation. Um, honestly, the American colonists really didn't have a problem paying taxes as long as they knew where the money was going. And so that was the issue. The issue wasn't the, Ameri it wasn't the American people being insincere or ungrateful for the British saving them from the, from the French and Native Americans. It was that when they said, hey, where's the money going and can we have a say in it, that's when the British laughed at them and said, yeah, no, that's not how this works. That's what angered the American colonists more than anything. And even today, I would argue that Americans, look, they don't like paying taxes, but they will. They just want to know where their money is going. And they want to make sure that their money is being spent right. And so often what you hear then is, well, if we just pay less taxes, then they have less money 
to, to spend in correctly. Um, that's not necessarily true, actually. It, it really just comes down to management, who you elect, and what it's going for. In fact, it actually requires, as I mentioned in Chapter 1, that we are vigilant, that we are actually paying attention to what's going on. You know, uh, we're humans, we're imperfect, so will there be corruption? Sure. But we have to keep in mind that we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater in this case. We want to make sure that we're not, you know, um, uh, uh, spiting our, our, you know, I'm mixing my metaphors here, excuse me, but we want to make sure that we don't spite ourselves you know, by making bad decisions. We just need to be careful. So keep in mind that it's the without representation part that actually is far more important for the American colonists. You know, taxes, yes, they paid, but where's the money going was actually far more important. Okay. Now, we became independent, so we need a government, and so the founders decided to put together what's known as the Articles of the Confederation, which you can refer to as an alliance of independent states. And so the Articles of Confederation lasted only a little more of a decade, and it taught the new nation a very valuable lesson about uh, effective government. Um, the idea was that the power should lie with the states, and then if the power lies with the states, we'll have better representation. Um, it'll be closer to the people. Why were state governments probably favored over the national government had everything to do with the Revolutionary War. You know, the British had tried to impose an imperial administration. The last thing the, uh, the, the colonists, now Americans, wanted was a central government that was strong enough to act like a new imperial administration. And so they said that state governments reflected popular desires, uh, there were annual elections, you saw the extended right to vote, there were very public legislative deliberations, and so you really did see that the, um, the states were closer to the people. They had this revolutionary spirit, uh, which actually unleashed kind of an egalitarian uh, urge. Now, the national government um, that was approved um, uh, through the Articles of Confederation developed what we know as the Confederation Congress. And the Confederation Congress, there was one body, rather, instead of having three branches of government, there was one branch of government, and it was very weak, dependent on the states. No real executive or central authority, no real central power to tax or to muster an army. In fact, um, you know, there was a lot of problems with this. So what were the successes of the Articles of Confederation? As I mentioned, the power was close to the people. Um, you know, under the Articles of Confederation, they did defeat the British military um, through the combined might of the, of the states. Population did grow rapidly. The economy expanded. Um, they stopped squabbling over Western land that had been conquered um, through the French and Indian War. But the problems were many. First and foremost, Congress could not raise taxes and had no money of its own. When Congress wanted, the Confederation Congress wanted to spend something, it had to ask the states for money. Massachusetts, New York, Virginia, do you mind giving us X amount of dollars we can spend? And obviously you can know what the answer to that was. No, they said, that's not going to happen. Uh, unanimity required to amending uh, the articles made it difficult, which meant that the articles was stagnant. State governments were dominated by their legislatures, and a weak national government had a real difficult time setting up the foreign powers. Um, we were struggling as a nation under the Articles of Confederation. Really, really struggled. The French were menacing at the border. The Spanish were menacing in uh, Spain. You had states were, uh, uh, you know, were arguing over economic waterways. For example, New Jersey and New York are arguing over who had control over the Hudson River. Um, New York had its own currency. New Jersey had its own currency. The kind of the uh, U.S. had its own currency. Each state could then negotiate with other countries on its tariffs or, or, or uh, um, uh, taxes on imports and exports. It was, it was quite the mess in terms of the Articles of Confederation. Um, the real uh, encapsulation of this was what we call Shays Rebellion. Now, people were really worried about the, um, about the uh, Articles of Confederation, and they saw that the country was really struggling to make things uh, the country was really struggling to solve its problems. And so um, they decided that the folks who had uh, called the Continental Congress had decided to call a new convention called the Annapolis Convention, Annapolis, Maryland. And they said that it was time to meet to discuss anew um, our, what would have been happening. Well, only 12 delegates from five states showed up. And they decided that um, the only thing they could really agree upon was just to try to meet next year. Well, before they could meet next year, um, you had a couple of things happen. The first one, which I don't have listed here, is called the Veterans Revolt. The Veterans Revolt is where um, veterans of the um, 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 
the War of Independence, were demanding that they be paid. And so because Confederation Congress couldn't raise its own money, it couldn't pay these veterans. So the veterans actually marched on Congress at the time, which was located in Philadelphia. And when the Confederation Congress reached out to Philadelphia and Pennsylvania for help, they said, hey, sorry, you're on your own. So literally what happened is the members of Congress fled before they could be um, beaten by these rioters. Uh, it doesn't sound like uh, the America that we're used to today. The one that was probably far more um, uh, dangerous is that of Captain Daniel Shea's rebellion. Um, Captain Daniel Shea was a war hero who had lost members of his family in the Revolutionary War. And, you know, Massachusetts helped finance the revolution uh, by incurring debt from France and from Spain and from the Netherlands. And so Massachusetts then had to pay back this debt. Well, it decided to pay back this debt by uh, um, taxing um, farmers. But it taxed farmers so high that when farmers couldn't pay, tax, pay back the, ta the tax, they would actually throw the farmers in jail in what was called debtor's prison. Back then, if you couldn't pay your debt, they threw you in jail. And if they did that today, I don't know, I think most of America would be in trouble. But Daniel Saves happened to be one of these. And so Daniel Saves is sitting in jail going, what am I doing? I, I almost died in the Revolutionary War. I had family. I, I'm, this is ridiculous. He busted out of jail. He ended up uh, gathering other people around him. And they ended up marching down onto the courthouse in Boston and threatening to burn down the entire uh, town. Now, at that time, Massachusetts Governor Bowden, he said, look, um, you know, he reached out to the Confederation Congress and he said, hey, I, uh, you know, I need a, a, an army. We need to put down, you know, Shays' Rebellion. And the Confederation Congress said, we can't do anything. You know, we'll go ask the other states. And the other states said, hey, Massachusetts, that's your own problem. So Governor Bowden essentially what he did was hire a private army. Uh, most of them were, you know, mercenaries. Uh, a good chunk of them were actually what we called Hessians that came over from Germany. And, but most of them were people already living in the U.S. And they, you know, hired a private army. They defeated Captain Daniel Shays, and they ended up arresting him, putting him on trial, and executing him. So we're talking about some pretty, you know, turbulent times here in the United States. And Shays' sympathizers, uh, they really changed the strategy from rebellion to politics. When they saw that they couldn't, um, you know, defeat uh, uh, the Massachusetts government voluntarily, they just decided to join the government and change it from the inside. And so it, it was quite the, uh, you know, quite the upending times. Now, re this, the elites of America got really scared. They said, you know what? They said, we need to do something about this because Shays' Rebellion could happen anywhere, not just in Massachusetts. And so when they met again, as they had promised at the Annapolis Convention, uh, at first, they said, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to revise the Articles of Confederation. But it quickly evolved into an opportunity to start over. And many of the delegates said that they wanted a stronger government that could provide political stability, uh, mediate conflicts, and defend the nation from foreign threats. Now, those who um, did not favor revision stayed away from the convention. For example, war hero Patrick Henry, uh, he rejected any major changes. In fact, he was very critical of the Constitution, saying, well, what, are these, what are we doing here? And if you look at the Constitution, I think, you know, Patrick Henry had kind of a point. If you look at the Con Constitutional Convention, it was actually a secret meeting of American elites. It was basically the, all the conspiracy theories come true. It was all the bankers, the merchants, the plantation owners, land speculators, anybody who had a serious amount of money, they were the ones who got together and um, they're the ones who got together and said, you know what, we're going to meet. And not only did they meet to completely discard the government and start a new one, they did it in secrecy, which, you know, if you think about it, you know, you're talking about the, the most elite people in America getting together saying that we're going to dump our government, start a new one, and we're not going to involve the public at all. And so, you know, was it a good idea to impose um, secrecy? You know, honestly, I guess it really depends how you look at it. As I mentioned in the uh, last chapter, as I mentioned um, you know, uh, as, as, as I may have mentioned before, um, you know, Thomas Jefferson said absolutely not. He called this an abominable precedent. He said, how could we do this, you know, that we're not involving the people? James Madison's like, no, actually, we need to be able to have, we need to be able to discuss real decisions and real problems in private. If it goes public, then sometimes what happens is uh, we're not going to be able to say what we really think. And I actually want to make this clear for us today. All of us tend to push that we want more and more openness in politics, and we want to know everything that our politicians are doing. Sometimes politicians have to cut deals. Sometimes politicians have to make decisions. If they're always being recorded, then they never really can, they never feel like they can say what they want to say. 
some of you would say, oh my gosh, that's, that's horrible. Why, why would you say that, Professor? But I want you to think about it. Um, you know, when, when parents are, are talking, sometimes they don't want the children to hear. When legislators are talking, sometimes they don't want their voters to hear. And it's not because it's malicious. It's because politics is, is, is a dirty business. Politics is a business where you have to make deals. And you can't make deals when everybody's putting a, a, an iPhone in your face or I got my new Samsung, a Samsung in your face. You know, you need to be able to negotiate uh, without being under duress. And so for the American elites at that time, they said, no, we're going to keep the secret because we want to be able to negotiate in full faith. We want to be able to negotiate without any pressure on us from the public. We want to do what's right, not just what's popular. And that's something I want you to keep in mind. Doing what's right isn't always popular. And in this case, um, as we'll see with the anti-federalist backlash, it, it was unpopular with the, the framers of the Constitution, how they had approached this. Now, what was the Constitutional Convention? If you look at the Convention in Madison, now we, we know a lot about the Convention because James Madison ended up being your fifth president. Um, he wrote all the notes. He wrote everything. He, he was writing down all the conversations, uh, speeches. I mean, it was amazing how many notes we have. In fact, a good chunk of their notes ended up becoming, um, and, and then his essays that he wrote from these notes became known as the Federalist Papers. So we know a lot about the Constitutional Convention. And what we read from Madison's notes is that there was a need to balance two political dangers. On the one hand, we were worried about a powerful central government that could strip the people of their rights. But on the other hand, we, we feared a weak government that could fail to protect their rights. So we really needed to find a balance between way too strong and way too weak. We needed a strong enough government and a not weak enough government. And that, that was the trick. That was the, the thing that they were trying to find. So there are a number of different um, themes, about six different themes then, that were going on at the uh, co convention that I want to touch about. The first one is how much power should we give to the people? And, you know, honestly, you know, there were people, there were people like Roger Sherman, you know, who said, look, you know what I mean? Um, the people should have as little to do with government. They, they lack information and are constantly liable to be misled. And so, you know, some other people like Elbridge Jerry said the people are the dupes of the pretended patriots. Uh, they didn't have, um, they didn't hold the common person in high esteem. They thought that the common person who lacked education and lacked, in, you know, um, um, access to information really didn't understand what was going on out there. I mean, this is an argument that you hear today. And so you hear this over and over and over again. This isn't anything new in American politics. And so they argued, and I think they argued somewhat successfully that if you look at this, too much democracy had led to chaotic government. And so too much democracy and other articles of confederation led to chaos. There was no organized responses to real threats, uh, be it foreign threats, be it economic threats, or be it internal threats like Shays' Rebellion. They called this the excess of democracy. And so the delegates then developed a view of representation that James Madison had labeled filtration what's called indirect um, elections. In other words, the public would vote for men and later women who would in turn vote for public officials. A good example of this would be the Electoral College. So the men of the, of the states voted for state legisl uh, legislators in the state assembly who then picked electors, who then picked the president. The idea was that you wanted to find the most wise, the most um, educated people so that way they could pick the best person to be president and not just who happened to be the most popular person. Uh, they feared, again, Madison feared what he called the tyranny of the majority. You know, he feared that, um, you know, the people would be led astray. And this is a key part that I think we, you know, especially people say, oh, the Constitution and everything's about the Constitution and I know students who carry the Constitution with them. Keep in mind that the Constitution isn't as democratic as we think it is. In fact, a lot of it was made to put a check on popular will, a republic, in order to keep us from um, excesses. Now, over time, citizens have been more control. For example, um, the electors now that elect the president are actually doing our will. Each set of electors from each state uh, represent um, the view of the people in that state. And I'll get into that in, in a couple of slides. Uh, we vote directly for senators now. Uh, whereas before, state legislatures would pick their senators. Women run the right to vote. African Americans won the right to vote uh, in the 15th Amendment, uh, but then actually fought through civil rights and got it in the Voting Rights Act in 1965, and 18-year-olds won the right to vote in 1971. So over time, we've gotten, we've received more power, but there's still these checks and balances that limit the will of the majority. The second theme is that of the national government versus state government. And delegates really compromised on a system that included both national and state power. 
Okay, let me pull my notes up here. The federal government took over many functions of the government, but far fewer than Madison had originally proposed. And the states kept many other duties, but far fewer than the state advocates would have liked. So this mixed system with a stronger national government, but that nevertheless leaves considerable power with the state governments is called federalism, and we'll address that in the next chapter. The third theme is that uh, around a division that we, don't, we no longer think about, and that was large states uh, versus small states. Now, the large states weren't large in terms of size, they were large in terms of population, like Virginia and Pennsylvania. The small states had a small population, like New Jersey and Delaware. So when we're talking about representation and how much representation each state should have, large states arguably said, well, representation in the national government should be based on population. It makes sense. We have more people, we should have more say. Well, small states like New Jersey say, well, that's not fair, because then if we do this, then we're never going to have a voice. So instead, they wanted each state to have an equal voice by having a certain number of, the equal number of elected people. Now, if you look, the uh, delegates from Virginia proposed what was known as the Virginia uh, Plan, uh, which was a big state uh, proposal. There would be a bicameral legislature where both chambers would be based on population. The citizens would elect the House of Representatives. The House would elect the Senate. Congress then would elect the president. And there would be a Supreme Court or court, so that justices would have lifetime tenure, and Congress would have broad powers to legislate. Um, in response, the small states proposed what's known as the New Jersey Plan, which was by the New Jersey delegates. The New Jersey Plan said that Congress would have one chamber, it'd be unicameral, and each state would only have one vote. An executive would be a committee uh, by, elected by Congress, and this executive committee would then select the Supreme Court, there'd, and there'd be a national government that would not tax the people, but tax the states. And so it almost came to a head. Um, they were arguing at the convention in Philadelphia, and a lar uh, uh, the large states actually briefly considered leaving and actually forming their own union, and the small states were threatening to do the same. Finally, what happened is they gave the task of uh, moderates to resolve the problem who had come from Connecticut. And interestingly enough, Connecticut found itself right in the middle. It was neither a big state nor a small state. Uh, we'd consider it a small state in today's uh, terms, but back then it would consider itself a middle state. And so literally what they did is the representatives from Connecticut uh, went around the corner to a bar, uh, which is still there today, and they sat down and had some ale, and they actually drew out what they call the Connecticut Compromise, what some people would argue is a napkin or a scratch piece of paper. And this Connecticut Compromise is where they decided to uh, split the difference. So they would have a two-chamber Congress, and in this two-chamber Congress would be a House of Representatives, which would be based on population, and there would be a Senate that would be uh, uh, equal representation, two senators per state. Uh, and originally it would be chosen by the state legislatures. And so they decided to have an independent Supreme Court, and they decided to have an independently elected president that was not elected by Congress, that it was elected in some other fashion. And so this seemed to satisfy both the big states uh, and the small states. And so this president that they decided would be independent and separate from Congress. And this president would have real power and he would have what we know as executive authority. Now, originally they weren't sure, should we have a committee or should we have just one individual? And they kind of feared that if it was a committee, an executive committee, that it would almost be like what they call the fetus of monarchy is what one founder called it, that these would be the next uh, American uh, um, aristocracy. So after much back and forth, they decided there would be one person and they would settle on a four-year term but permit re-elections. So the next step is, okay, now we're going to decide it's one person rather than a committee. Um, how should we elect this president then? Should there be direct elections or, sh or should there be state legislatures? Um, again, the founders feared direct elections. Madison said, no, watch out for the mobocracy. You know, somebody could come in and manipulate the will of the people and get elected and cause damage. Um, should we leave it up to the states? No, because then the bigger states would outdo the smaller states. So again, they met at the bar around the corner, and they decided to sit down and have a beer, and they decided over uh, what they came up with what's known as the Electoral College. And the Electoral College is that each state would select individuals <clears throat> known as electors. And the delegates hoped that the electors would be well-known individuals with sound judgment, and then the electors would elect uh, the president. And so that's what you saw uh, up until about the 1820s. 
is that these electors were chosen by um, um, lawmakers in each state. So the state of New Jersey's lawmakers would select the electors. These electors would meet in a college. College in Latin means get together. So the electoral college, they would meet and they would debate and discuss who they wanted for president. People would then nominate themselves and say, I'm thinking about being president, you know, and they would sit there and talk. Um, it wasn't too popular. And so because it wasn't too popular, it was unpopular because a lot of the people felt that their votes didn't count. Because the American people voted, but it's almost as if their votes didn't count. So by quickly within about 30 years, most states had adopted resolutions changing this, saying that these electors now travel from, let's say, New Jersey to Washington, D.C., and they have to represent the will of the people. So if New Jersey votes for someone, those electors have to go down there and vote the way that the people did. And so the electors today are simply just people who have been uh, chosen by uh, the victor in each state to go represent them. So if uh, President Obama won California in 2012, President Obama nominates 55 electors from California, the state uh, the legislature ratifies them, and then they go to um, Washington, D.C., and they vote an affirmative for Obama. So the le the, in today's world, the electors don't have any independent authority. They have to do what the California voters tell them or New Jersey voters tell them. And, you know, if not, they can actually get into a lot of trouble. And so, um, you know, they can, in some cases, we call this um, a, a faithless elector laws where in some places like Oregon, they can be hit with $100,000 fines and go to jail for several number of years. So how does the Electoral College work today? Um, each state selects a number of electors equal to the sum of its House and Senate seats. So California has 53 seats in the House and two um, Senate seats. Remember now each uh, state has only two seats in the Senate. Gives it 55 electoral votes. Um, that means there's 538 electoral votes total. There's 430 seats total in the House, 100 total seats in the Senate. And then um, an amendment gave three seats for Washington, D.C., or three votes, I should say, for Washington, D.C. And so the candidate with the most electoral votes gets 50% plus one, or in this case, 270 votes, which is a majority, and it becomes president. Now, interestingly enough, then, what's more important is that you win the electoral vote and not necessarily the popular vote. So the candidate who wins the most popular votes may not become president because electoral votes are what matters. So what I mean by this is, is that there's a national, we tally up all the votes nationwide, and the president, the, person, the candidate who wins that national vote may not end up becoming president because what matters is the electoral vote. And so I want you to think of it this way, because often people get confused with the Electoral College, is that it's really not one election. It's kind of a misnomer. When the media says it's a presidential election, it's actually not. It's 51 elections all on the same day. Each state decides how it wants its electors to vote. Back in the day, the state legislature would pick electors and the electors would vote their conscience. In today's world, the state legislature picks electors that make sure that they represent the vote of the people in that state. So when you go to vote in the 2016 election, whoever you vote for, if the majority of you vote for that candidate, then that, the electors will represent that candidate when they go to vote in the Electoral College. So now it's a formality. In today's internet, we now know who's going to win. We don't need to have an elector go, but it's a tradition. It's a formality. Now, what happens? Because I said here that the electors go and represent your vote. What they do is they actually represent, 48 states have actually said that you're going to have, that, that they're going to have a winner-takes-all system. In other words, if there's 55 electoral votes in, in California, we're not going to split them up between Obama and Romney. We're going to give the winner all the votes. So, you know, Romney got 35% of the vote in California in 2012. We're not going to give him 35% of the electoral votes. We're just going to give Obama all 55. This is this winner-takes-all. Because of the winner-takes-all system, there's a circumstance where one person can win the popular vote uh, if this is a circumstance where, you know, one person can win the popular vote but lose electoral votes. And so because of this winner takes all, what happens is people run up the vote in certain states. And I'll get to this in the next slide and I'll show you. Now, it's only been four times um, in American history that this has happened where people have won the popular vote but lost the electoral vote. Most recently happened in the 2000 election between Bush and Gore. Let me show you this map here. This is what I was talking about right here, that California has um, 55 electoral votes. Notice that California then is a juggernaut in comparison to other states. Another major player would be, um, you know, Texas with 38, you know, um, Florida with 29, 
you know, you see New York with 29. And so they're, you know, Florida, I mean, these are the big, big states. And these big states have, you know, we'll get to this later on. California is reliably Democrat. Texas is reliably Republican. Um, New York's reliably Democrat. Florida kind of goes back and forth. And so, but I wanted to show you how this map looks like and who, you know, all the number of votes that exists in Electoral College. Now, what I did here in this is I weighted it by population. I should say the authors weighted it by population. Um, I showed you earlier the map of the United States and the number of votes in each. Now what I did is I show you how California looks right here in comparison to the rest of the nation in terms of how important it is. The same for Texas, uh, the same for New York right here as I circle this, and then the same for uh, uh, Florida here. Now this winner takes all is very interesting. 48 states have laws that said the candidate who wins the state's popular vote receives all the state's electoral votes. Thus a candidate who wins the state by only a few votes can get all the electoral votes. This is why the popular vote winner can lose the electoral college vote because winning by large margins in a state is the same as only winning by one vote. So I want to show you here the 2000 presidential election. I'm going to circle California here. At the time, California only had 54 electoral votes. Now it has 55. Uh, they reapportion uh, the seats after every census, and we'll get into that when we talk about uh, uh, Congress. But notice here, George Bush got 41% of the votes. Al Gore got 53% of the votes. In fact, Al Gore got 1.2 million more votes than George Bush. So Al Gore really ran up the popular vote in places like California. So Al Gore, when he won in certain states, he won big. Like he really just killed George Bush in California, New York, Illinois. So he really ran up the popular vote in those states. But remember, this is not a national election. This is truly an election of 51 entities on one day, 50 states in Washington, D.C. And notice here what happened is George Bush just simply racked up all the small states. And if I see here, we'll look at this later. It's called the Republican L or the Republican lock. And George Bush won all the little states. And in some states, he didn't win by much. In fact, in Florida right here, which we'll talk about later, he only won by 537 votes. So he barely won in Florida. But because it's winner takes all, George Bush got all the votes in Florida, which actually put him over the top. So it doesn't help for you to run up the vote in states you're going to win. What you need to do is win more states. And everyone says, okay, well, should we reform the Electoral College? That's not going to happen because small states want the Electoral College because it makes them relevant. Um, because if a vote is a direct election, if we just said, hey, let's directly elect the president, you wouldn't, presidential candidates would never visit Iowa like they are now or New Hampshire. Uh, you'd probably just go to six major cities. You'd probably go to New York, L.A., uh, Houston, Miami, Chicago, um, I don't know, Washington, D.C. Why would you go anywhere else? You wouldn't even, it's not that you wouldn't visit California. You would just visit L.A., you know, so you'd ignore the rest of California. So it's not really in anybody's interest to reform um, the uh, uh, like electoral college because the smaller states have a lot more say-so. They matter because you're winning states. You're not winning the overall popular vote. You're winning the state vote. So if you think of it that way, that your, your goal as a presidential candidate is to really win as many states as you can, then the electoral college actually becomes easier to, to comprehend. Okay? Now, um, the number 50 was that of checks and balances. Uh, we've talked about this before, that each power, uh, each, uh, each power of the Constitution grants to Congress or the presidency or the judiciary is balanced by a countervailing or a checking power assigned to another branch. So, for example, uh, the president um, has uh, a check over Congress. Congress passes legislation but needs the president to sign the law. The president can veto or, and re or reject the bill uh, sent by Congress. Congress has power over the president. The president is the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, but the Constitution gives Congress the power to declare war and set the military's budget. Congress can override a veto by two-thirds of vote of both chambers. The president negotiates treaties, but the Senate must ratify them by two-thirds. The president appoints ministers and Supreme Court justices, uh, but, the, but the Senate must approve them. And Congress has the ultimate power over all federal authorities, uh, federal officers. The House can impeach uh, or formally accuse the president of high crimes and misdemeanors, and then the Senate um, has a trial and uh, acts like a trial and then can convict the president of said high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, and the court has uh, power over Congress and the president. 
The court has the power of what we call judicial review. It has the authority to strike down acts of Congress or the president for violating the Constitution. And so the French political philosopher Montesquieu wrote an influential treatise, The Spirit of the Laws, back in the 1700s, which argued to avoid tyranny, the executive, legislative, and judicial functions of government should be separated from one another. And then uh, um, John Locke came along and said, yeah, not only should they be separated, they should actually have be uh, balanced against each other through these, uh, through these checks. Now, the sixth theme that we see is that of slavery. A slavery was a divisive theme throughout the entire Constitutional Convention. In fact, the authors label it a principle that we were ashamed of. Um, nobody ever really seriously considered um, eliminating slavery. There was only one person at the convention um, who, in the opening prayer of the convention, would pray that slavery would come to an end, and that was Ben Franklin. And from Madison's notes, you would hear that Southern delegates would murmur, and in some cases they threw stuff at him because they were so angry that he would openly call for the end of slavery. As a Quaker um, from Pennsylvania, he had a strong, strong moral objection to slavery, and he was the only one who would publicly call out and say, no, we need to end this. Um, but of course, as you saw, that's not what happened. Um, why? Why didn't they um, just uh, ban slavery as the British did a couple decades later? Um, well, simple. The men and women in bondage were a source of great wealth and power. Um, you know, a good number of the delegates there derived their wealth, their elite status from being slave owners. The last thing they wanted to do was give up money. The last thing they wanted to do was give up their wealth. Uh, their wealth gave them power. Their power allowed them to have wealth. For them, slavery was an intricate part of who they were, of their identity. And so, the Philadelphia Convention kind of faced a stark choice. Uh, do we protect slavery, or do we form a union without these slave states? Because the slave states said, we won't join. If we have an eventual plan to eliminate slavery, we're not going to join the union. So essentially what they decided to do was not protect slavery per se, but essentially leave it alone, kick the can down the road. And boy, did they kick the can down the road. Uh, in fact, the can was kicked... Um, so far um, that they ended up fighting a civil war over this. And in fact, I always tell people this, you know, um, I have students who come and say, well, the civil war was about states' rights. That, that's historically inaccurate. Um, anything that you read, if you read the reasons why um, Georgia seceded, why South Carolina seceded, if you read the Te Texas Declaration of Secession, you will see that the number one reason why they left was slavery. That they simply felt that by freeing black slaves, these states would collapse, that they would lose their wealth and power. It wasn't state rights. It had everything to do with bondage and slavery. And so it's revisionist history when people say, oh, it's about state rights. No, no, no. It's not even about the state right of slavery. It's about slavery itself. And I encourage you to go and read those documents yourself. You're, you're not going to like what you read. Uh, they're pretty racist, and they have a lot of language in them that, that most people would find offensive. And so... Um, you know, you'll see that it really is about slavery. And in fact, over 600,000 Americans died. Uh, ended up becoming a major moral issue where northern whites found slavery to be an abomination against God and used biblical arguments against slavery, while um, southern whites um, would use Old Testament. And you can email me later if you want. I can send you a, a nice reading from the 1930s that actually, you know, sums up the biblical arguments for and against slavery. And it had become a, a, a moral crisis in the United States that was ultimately solved with violence. And, 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 you know, one out of every Americans either died or were wounded in that conflict. It was, it was a major, major conflict. One of the, the last time we had such major violence in the United States. Uh, so in the end, what did our delegates do? They wanted a strong union. And their desire to have a strong union to survive as a country was uh, more important than the hate that they had for uh, uh, slavery. So in the Constitutional Convention, they came up with a number of compromises. The first was that of the three-fifths compromise. And I want to make something very clear here. You were, most of you, when I teach in this class, they tend to say, oh, that slaves are three-fifths of a person. No, that is incorrect. Your high school teacher may have told you that that is wrong. Slaves are not three-fifths of a person. Slaves were not people. According to many state constitutions and state laws, slaves are what we call chattel. Chattel is the equivalent of livestock. So if you were a slave, you had the same legal equivalent as, let's say, a, um, you know, as an ox or a cow in the field. You were considered livestock, which means they could brand you, they could breed you, they could do whatever they wanted with you. That's what that meant. That's what my saying that they were property of others. They were not three-fifths of a person. They were not a person legally at all. 
of course, there's a lot of paradox in this because many slave owners would preach gospel to uh, slaves, which meant if they weren't people, did they really have souls, and why did you preach to them? So the South, the antebellum South, was full of 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 of, of paradoxes and full of of, of 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Um, hypocrisy. So this isn't you know don't look for a lot of reason in this stuff. A lot of it was just protection of self-interest. What they meant by the three-fifths compromise was that for representation purposes, three-fifths of all other persons would count. Look at this um, graph here, this table here, excuse me, and you'll see that um, slaves constituted a significant part of some of the population. So, for example, if you look at South Carolina, slaves are 43% of the population, which means if we actually um, um, didn't count the slaves, South Carolina would have a lot less representation in Congress in the House of Representatives. And so it was in South Carolina's interest to make sure that slaves counted in the population so they would receive more representatives. Well, Northerners obviously were aghast at this. Look at Massachusetts. They had zero slaves whatsoever. And they said, no, we're not going to stand for this. Why should, you don't think slaves are people, then why should we, uh, why should we count them in the population census? And so they compromised. They said, we'll count three-fifths of all other persons. Now, the Southerners wanted to put the word slavery in the Constitution, but the, um, the Northerners said, no, we're going to put all others. And that actually ended up being very key, because without the word slave in the Constitution, later Supreme Courts had a difficult time justifying uh, slavery because it wasn't actually written in the Constitution. The other thing that they did is they decided that they told the South, we're going to end the slave trade. They gave them 20 years to import as many slaves as they could, and then they were done after that. It didn't quite end the slave trade. It just went illegal after that, but it made it more difficult to bring slaves into the country. And there was compromise. The Northerners said, fine, then we're going to increase import taxes because Southerners were selling uh, cotton to the British. The British were selling clothes to the Southerners. Um, the Northerners were making clothes, and so by putting taxes on British clothes, it forced the Southerners to buy it from the North, which then kept the economy going in the North. They also put in what they call the Fugitive Slave Clause, not in the Constitution itself, but essentially they passed on law, the Fugitive Slave Act, Fugitive Slave Act, which said um, you know, that, that northern states would help southern states if fugitive slaves ran away. And of course, many northern states did not do that, Massachusetts being one of the leading states, and that caused a lot of friction by southerners saying, you're not keeping your end of the bargain. And this all became what we know as a national uh, calamity. You know what I mean? Um, you know, George and Mason called this a national calamity, and he ended up being right. Uh, 72 years later, Abraham Lincoln would echo, you know, Mason as he reflected on the carnage of the Civil War. And in his second inaugural address, where he said, God gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense of slavery came. And so um, this was a uh, stain, the stain of slavery, as we call it, that wasn't solved until the, um, the end of the uh, Civil War. Now let's look at an overview of the Constitution. The Constitution begins with a preamble, the most elegant sentence probably in the entire document, which is, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure dom uh, domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote for the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. And it offered uh, six goals um, for, a, um, for a successful government, as you can see here. Now, to kind of go quickly through the constitution itself, Article 1 has to deal with Congress. And Article 1 um, is the longest in the constitution and describes what Congress may or may not do. Section 8 is probably the most important passage in Article 1. It's got 17 short paragraphs, and it tells Congress what it may and may not do. Well, it's called uh, enumerated powers, written down powers. This includes the power to lay and collect taxes, declare war, regu regulate interstate commerce, coin money, excuse me, and raise an army. The final paragraph is known as what's called the Necessary and Proper Clause. Extremely important because if Congress has the right to raise an army, then it's necessary and proper to declare a draft. If Congress has the right to coin money, then it's necessary and proper to have a national mint. So in other words, the necessary and proper clause really expanded the power of Congress. It says, look, well, Congress can actually establish a lot of things and do a lot of things in society because it's necessary and proper to carry out its duties. Section 9 uh, lists the things Congress may not do. For example, the writ of habeas corpus. Um, you know, um, Congress cannot take away, cannot suspend the writ of habeas corpus instead of times of rebellion or during war. 
what habeas corpus means is that the government cannot hold prisoners without formally charging them with a the crime. In other words, that if you are actually arrested by the police and sent to jail, you have the right to see a judge and question your detainment. And they either have to charge you with something or they have to let you go. They can't keep you indefinitely, which is what would happen uh, back in Imperial England. If they had a per person they didn't like that was causing problems, they'd just throw them in jail and forget about them. And this is what you would see uh, a lot. You see this actually in a lot of other countries, too. Um, Article 2 is the president. It says that the president must be a natural-born American, at least 35 years old, who is chosen by electors for a four-year term. Each state gets to decide who the electors are. Today, the people make the choice, and the electors simply represent the choice of the people at the Electoral College. And Section 4 allows for removing a president on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, three presidents have faced formal impeachment uh, proceedings. Um, Andrew Johnson, who uh, succeeded um, uh, Abraham Lincoln, upon his assassination in 1865, um, he was charged with high crimes and misdemeanor violating particular acts. Most historians would agree that they were trumped up charges. Andrew Johnson was a, a Southerner. He was a Tennessee Democrat who uh, Lincoln had brought on the ticket as a sign of unity. And of course, after the Civil War, when the radical Republicans wanted to punish the South, he kept vetoing the measures. They kept overriding his veto, so they finally said, let's just get this guy out of the way. Uh, after his uh, impeachment, he was acquitted by one vote by the Senate, and he said, I'm no longer going to fight the Republicans, and he just signed off on everything and then disappeared from politics after his term. The second person was Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was had articles of impeachment drawn up against him, but he had never actually been formally impeached. Uh, Richard Nixon had was going to be impeached, though, for the Watergate scandal, where he ordered the FBI to break into the Democratic Party headquarters at the Watergate Hotel to uh, steal their plans to find out how they were going to win the election in 72. Um, bit of paranoia because Nixon won that in a landslide and all the surveys show he was. So the fact that he ordered the FBI to break into the Democratic Party headquarters is, is really wrong. And the American people were like, no, this isn't right. And then they were going to get rid of him. But he resigned before they could, uh, before they could uh, impeach him and probably remove him. The last president to be impeached was that of Bill Clinton in 1998. Um, he was accused of perjury or lying under oath for having an affair with an intern, Monica Lewinsky, in the White House. Um, he said, you know, in his very famous saying, I did not have sex with that woman. And so that phrase there, because it was a lie, uh, Republicans in Congress impeached him. Uh, the Republicans in the House, excuse me, impeached him over that phrase, over that exact sentence, excuse me. And then the Senate, in, in later on that year, decided not to uh, uh, um, convict him. They acquitted him. And so he ended up uh, serving out the rest of his second term. All right. Article 3 of the courts. Article 3 created the Supreme Court and authorizes Congress to organize additional courts. Alexander Hamilton um, later called the Supreme Court the least dangerous branch of government because it's passive. Um, the Supreme Court doesn't act, of, the Supreme Court cannot create its own cases. People have to bring cases to court. So if there's no cases, then there's nothing for judges to judge on. So it is a passive branch of government in that aspect. But it's, once it gets a case, man, it, judges can really change the way things happen in American society. So they have a lot of power. It's just the power is in a different way. Now, justices are selected by the president, and they're approved by the Senate, and they have tenure for life. That, they are, federal judges are there for life. They can, they can only be removed if they're impeached and then convicted. And that gives them a lot of power because they outlive presidencies and congresses. And so they are there as a conscious. And, and judges are important. I, I mean, I sound so and this, but they judge. They, they make judgments about what should be right and wrong in our society. And so they have a lot, an immense amount of authority in our, uh, in our society. Uh, one of them, Chief Justice John Marshall, um, in a case uh, called Marbury versus Madison, he actually ruled that the court could actually strike down an act of Congress, or what we call judicial review. It's a complicated thing. I'm going to explain this more when we get into Chapter 16 on what actually judicial review looks like and how Chief Justice John Marshall actually developed this idea. The next uh, uh, four articles, uh, the Article 4 talks about relations between the states. Article 5 talks about amendments. Article 6 talks about how the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And Article 7 talks about ratification and how we should ratify the Constitution. I just lightly go over these. In terms of ratification, the debate over the Constitution was fought out in the public through editorials, regardless of the fact that most Americans are not allowed to vote for ratification. So interestingly enough, I mentioned that the Constitutional Convention was a secret meeting of elites. But 
like all secrets, they're not well kept. And so it got out that they were discussing a new government, and then finally what happened is they decided to have a, uh, each state ratify the new constitution. So obviously word got out, and what happened is people were angry, so defenders of the constitution started writing editorials. Um, detractors or people who were against the Constitution started writing editorials. They were meeting. A lot of those editorials then were, as I mentioned earlier, put together in what we call the Federalist Papers. And a lot of the editorials against the uh, uh, ratification of the Constitution were called the Anti-Federalist Papers. So the Anti-Federalists were really upset because they saw an absence of a Bill of Rights. They said, where is the limited government? Remember we talked about in Chapter 2, one of the main ideas was the limited government. Well, where's the limited government, they said. We don't see the limited government. And so they preferred the Articles of Confederation because it was a limited government. It was decentralized. Um, you know, the, most of the power was in the state, so that meant that there was popular government. They feared a tyranny. They feared who is this new president that they speak of, who is this powerful president. And they feared a Congress with too few representatives. Federalists fought back and said, guys, we, we've tried this for 10 years and it's not working. We're falling apart, it seems. We need a national government that's necessary so we can create a strong country. Internal threats were a concern. And, you know, look, they, Madison argued, internal factions um, can impose their will on others. We just don't have to fear external threats. There are internal threats. That also equals tyranny. In fact, why can't tyranny exist under a popular government? In fact, it can. So he said, in order to make sure that the federal, no one can take advantage of the power of the federal government, we're going to separate the powers and then we're going to have checks and balances, I mentioned earlier. So if you see, it was actually a very close vote for the Constitution. Um, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, um, you know, once New Hampshire ratified it, technically the uh, Constitution went into effect. You only needed nine out of the 13 states. But without the two biggest, most populous states, Virginia and New York, it wasn't going to work. So George Washington went to work in Virginia, and Alexander Hamilton went to work in New York, and they were able to get the, um, the Constitution, New Constitution ratified. And then finally, the last state to uh, ratify the Constitution was Rhode Island. They barely did. Uh, <laughs> many people argue Rhode Island still to this day uh, isn't really sure if they ever want to be in the Union. They've always had a kind of an independent streak to them. All right, last thing is the Bill of Rights. Um, what of the protection of people's liberties, as I mentioned? They were neglected to be included in the provisions in the draft of the Constitution. Uh, some people argued, well, do they need to be in the Constitution? Because state constitutions generally included such provisions. Maybe it's better to protect uh, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, these negative liberties, as we talked about. Um, maybe it's better to be the duty of the states rather than to be the duty of the federal government. And so it was a major roadblock to ratification. So what James Madison did during the discussion is he said that I will, once I become the elected member of Congress, is propose the Bill of Rights. And that's exactly what he did. He proposed um, 17 amendments. Uh, uh, 12 of them were approved by Congress, and 10 of them were then ratified by the states. Those uh, 10 are right here on the left, and they are known as the Bill of Rights. I'm not going to go through them in the interest of time. And then what you see in the next uh, um, uh, uh, or the next table are the next 17 amendments. In fact, I want to circle this one down here, number 27. Our latest amendment that came into effect in 1982 was actually one of the original amendments proposed by James Madison back in 1789. Uh, and what had happened is that it just never had been ratified by three-fourths of the states until 1992. And that one says establish that congressional pay raises couldn't go into effect until the next election. In other words, if Congress gave itself a pay raise, the people had a right to vote on whether or not they wanted to kick those folks out for the type of raise that they gave themselves. So the Constitution today. Uh, Americans disagree about how to read the Constitution. Um, the Constitution, is it a uh, document that should be left alone and preserved, and we should always go back to it as a source of inspiration, a source of understanding things? Um, those folks tend to see the, an, an original meaning in the Constitution, or, or they seem to construct it in a very strict sense. These originalists uh, insist that Americans are bound to the literal meaning of the Constitution, look at how they wrote it, what was the original reason for writing the clause this way or writing the phrase this way, and that's how we should understand politics today. Others disagree. They say, no, 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 the Constitution is a living document. It's evolving, and so we need to be more pragmatic 
about this stuff. We cannot help but bring our own background ideas and judgments to bear. In other words, what we mean by privacy now is not what the founders meant by privacy. Maybe what we mean by the right to bear arms now is not what the right to bear arms means by the founders. And actually that is true. We'll get into that in the Second Amendment. But the founders meant by the right to bear arms is actually not the way we see it today. We see it in a different light. As we see privacy in a different light, as we see freedom of speech, as we see many things differently today than we did um, 230 years ago. So in conclusion, does the Constitution still work? Um, I think the answer is yes. I think most politicians would say, yeah, here we are. We're, we're still going. You know, we're still here. Um, there are some who disagree. A famous political scientist by the name of Robert Dahl from Harvard says, no, the Constitution probably is not democratic enough. You don't see modern rights. You know, for example, I just mentioned the right to privacy. It's actually not written in the Constitution. It's something that came out of the Ninth Amendment, which we'll talk about later. And the checks and balances, he argues, are too cumbersome, making it maybe too difficult to pass laws in a manner, in a timely manner. But regardless of whether you think the Constitution is working, not working, or whether you're an originalist, a pragmatist, or somewhere in between, it's always a good idea to check the Constitution. Every time you study another feature of politics, go back to the Constitution as, as, and start from there. And then from there, look at the history, and that'll help you understand politics. All right, and that concludes the lecture for Chapter 3 in Maroney and Kirsch's book, um, By the People, a Debating American Government, and Chapter 3 entitled, The Constitution.